Well, good morning, wherever, whenever you're listening to this, uh, good morning, Endow ladies, and I'm here with Father John Henry Hansen. Hi, Father, how are you? Simone, I'm great. It's good to talk to you and to see you <laughs> good to miles talk to away. <laughs> yes, I'm so, so happy that we get to speak this morning, and I'm excited because I know that this is your, uh, your first uh, Zoom experience. So. It sure is, and I, as we were saying, it, it's a little bit weird, <laughs> but it's, it's a, a good... Good though. <laughs> a little bit weird, but I'm so so happy to see you today, even if it has to be through the through the computer through, screen. Through the computer screen, yeah. It is very strange, but we're. I'm definitely getting very used to it, and uh, you know, you're kind of lucky, uh, blessed that you you aren't used to it right now with all the COVID stuff happening. So if you've managed to avoid it, <laughs> <laughs> so far. <laughs> so far, yes. Yeah. Well, for those that are watching, um, I'm with Father John Henry Hansen, who is a Norbertine at St. Michael's Abbey in Silverado, California, Southern California. And I hear, Father, I hear from my, my friends who live in Orange County that, uh, that you are the light, that the Norbertines are the light of, of uh, Southern California. So I cannot disagree after getting to know you this past week. <laughs> so, so I'm so, so happy about that. To have you and uh anyway i will um mention some other things that father father john henry is up to these days but for now i would just like to say that father you and i met last year actually at an endow retreat at the carmelite yes in alhambra um alhambra. yeah it was a conference i think at the saint joseph campus and i i was hearing confessions there and i think that's where i met you <laughs> yes i i was one of the speakers so i cut the line and yes <laughs> Do I have to confess that? I just like, or am I just allowed? Because I have to get back into work. I'm still not sure about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I think I awkwardly asked for permission. But I'm so so happy uh, that I did meet you, and that uh, that you do that. So that's actually another connection. Is that in Dow we have our annual um, retreat with the Carmelites, and actually, Father, one of the things that you do is actually serve women's communities. Correct? Am I am I correct in that? Yes, that's correct. Uh, a couple of them. Uh, one of them is the uh, the Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart of Los Angeles um, in Alhambra, mainly. Um, I I give spiritual direction to them. I celebrate masses for them. Uh, hear confessions for them often, and normally once or twice a year I give a retreat also. So I'll be my next scheduled retreat if it doesn't get canceled. <laughs> Uh, is Advent of this year, the beginning of Advent. Uh, I think December 1st, 3rd, 2nd, and 3rd, something somewhere around there. Uh, they are, as every place else, is canceling events through May or June. So anyway, please God will be able to, to hold that retreat. Yes, I, I definitely pray for that too. And, and Father, Father will also be, for those who are watching and who are in Southern California, or nearby places will be one of our speakers for the Feminine Genius Brunch at the Sacred Heart Retreat House of the Carmelites in October. So hopefully that won't get canceled. Hope, too. Exactly, yes. <laughs> Yikes, we'll see. Well, maybe we'll just have to take everything on Zoom, but God willing, not. God willing not. Well, Father, there are so many things I want to talk to you about today. So I think we can get started on that. One of them is that you just published, this book was just published. Yes, that, that came out uh, last last January, I think, twenty of twenty nineteen. Yeah, um, so it's praying from the depths of the Psalms. So. Yes, and I remember you telling me about it before it was published uh, because there's a lot of, and I admit that I haven't read it because at, when I got it, my my Armenian mother uh, <laughs> <laughs> took it. Pilfered it. <laughs> So I, so I, I said, okay, you can borrow it from me and then I'll read it after, but I've, I've skimmed some parts of it. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some subjects in here that might be helpful Please, yeah. in general, and maybe also for, for, um, this, this time, the strange, very strange time that we're living in. Yeah. Yeah. And I should, I should mention that the, the reason I bring up Armenian is because I, you know, father, you do the Armenian mass, the Armenian Badarak. Yes. For the uh, Armenian Catholic Cathedral here in Los Angeles. So how has that been? So can I call you by ritual or how does that work? Uh, I think you can call me by okay. ritual. Uh, and that simply means in the, in the Catholic Church that you celebrate the sacred liturgy according to multiple rites. Uh, there, are, there are a number of different rites in the Catholic Church. Um, 
the Armenian being one of the Eastern rites, the Oriental rites. Um, and I've been celebrating mass there at the St. Gregory the Illuminator, the Catholic Cathedral uh, of the Armenians in Los Angeles since 2016. Um, and uh, I am, although it doesn't show up on my face, I am uh, about a quarter Armenian. <laughs> I, I always say it, it, it's in my blood, but it's not on my face. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I also find that uh, many of the people who attend the mass there at the cathedral um, are not necessarily Armenians themselves. Uh, they are what you would call maybe mainstream Catholics who just appreciate the beauty of the Armenian liturgy um, as it is celebrated there. And it's, it is quite beautiful. Um, the vestments, the sanctuary of the church, the prayers are, are very, very ancient, very ancient and very, very beautiful. Um, so, and currently I'm still celebrating Master every Sunday, but it's now live streamed. <laughs> so um, I, I'm getting a congregation about uh, uh, 20 times more <laughs> online than what I would get in the pews. Um, That's right. And it's, of course, all over the world, too. So that's very interesting. Armenians from, you know, I, I've gotten people uh, chiming in from Alaska and from Beirut and, uh, you know, everywhere. So that's been a, a, a great joy to be able to reach so many people. Um, yeah, yes. what, I was going to say, what a strange grace that, in fact, doing the private math but putting it online has now been such a huge evangelization. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Effort. So, so yes, yeah, so anybody watching, if you want to watch the Armenian, the, the English Armenian Mass yes. at 30, you can go on St. Gregory the Illuminator um, Facebook page and you can mm -hmm. live stream it. And that's what I do. So I get yes. to see you every Sunday, but you don't get to see me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's really, really wonderful. And I, I thank you, Father, because actually my, my right is Armenian. So yes. I'm yes. Catholic. So if I didn't have that providential cutting the confession line uh, encounter with you, I would have <laughs> connected me back to my roots. So I'm very, very grateful for that. And I was, I mean, what you said is of course true. I was so surprised when I showed up for mass uh, that, I caught, that I saw people that I knew and people that I definitely were not Armenian, but yes. they were. Yeah. So I was very happy to, to, to fellowship with them and have communion with them. And that kind of leads me to another subject of, uh, what was your exposure to the Eastern Rites before uh, before 2016, before um, before you became biritual, I guess? Well, I uh, not not very extensive to be honest. Um, I I had never attended an Armenian Rite Mass growing up. My, my mother was baptized into the Armenian Apostolic Church in Fresno, where she was born. Fresno is also kind of an Armenian hub. Right, is Armenians it? hang out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she was born there and, and baptized there and then uh, be became Catholic in high school. Um, how did that happen? How, how did that happen? That's yeah. an, she, she, went to, she went to a Catholic high school. Oh, uh, okay. So, she... so that's kind of a story all by itself. But um, Did they make so, her did do a profession of faith or did, were they confused and confirmed her? Because, you know, there's all those issues there where you don't. Oh, well, I don't think they, they could. Uh, they could have they, they could acquire the the uh, paperwork for her her baptism so uh -huh. they they conditionally baptized her i see uh, uh, normally you wouldn't need to do that but but because every everything was was written in armenian so right. there wasn't anybody who could read that so conditional of a baptism only right. um so we i grew up going to Latin Rite Catholic masses and uh, didn't have much exposure to the Armenian Rite until just a few years ago. But other Eastern Rites, I had experienced the Melkite and Russian Orthodox um, a number of times. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, and I, I'd always been drawn to the Eastern Rites, but never thought I would have the opportunity to celebrate any of them. That's amazing. Some Armenian grandma or great grandma in heaven is probably just so happy that you I think so and I hope so yeah <laughs> That's so beautiful so yeah I encourage I encourage you those who are listening or watching um that if you've never attended an eastern rite catholic liturgy to 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 attend one on Sunday it 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 counts it's legitimate it is oh sure so it does yeah yeah sure. sometimes people get confused like oh you know no it it does fulfill your Sunday obligation it does fulfill your sure Sunday yeah obligation. 
question. Yeah. So um, actually, this is probably a good opportunity to explain a little bit about uh, the Eastern rites just in general. And and maybe I, I would love to hear from you also, Father, what's because, you know, John Paul II wrote in Ut Unum Sint that we have to breathe with both lungs and that. Yes. And so I guess in, I would love to hear from you in general, just a quick, for those who are listening, going, I, what is Eastern Rite? I don't know what that is. Um, maybe you could explain that. And then also what ha, it, what being part, part of the Eastern Rite has done for you, since you definitely breathe with both lungs. <laughs> yeah. Like the and, yeah. And then also now part of the uh, Armenian Rite. Okay, well, the, the Eastern Rites developed um, what we'd call in the e Eastern part of the Roman Empire. Uh, so going back into the ancient world, you have a number of churches founded in the Middle East, uh, sort of Middle East and Mediterranean world, uh, which were founded by apostles. And these, these churches grew up with their own liturgical traditions traditions, which were based in their cultures. So if you attend, uh, say, a, a Melkite liturgy or an Armenian liturgy, there are going to be some things in common, but a lot of things which are very culturally rooted in, say, a Greek uh, a cultural background, Russian, Armenian, Coptic, Egypt, right? Um, so you're, you're, you're going to find a cultural inheritance uh, which is kind of happily married to Christianity. Yeah. And, and these churches, which have existed from the beginning of, the, of, of Christianity, have done a really good job at maintaining their cultural inheritance along with their liturgical worship. Um, and that's really a, a distinctive mark of the Eastern churches. And that's why it can be a little bit of uh, a foreign experience if you're not accustomed to going to an Eastern Rite liturgy to attend one, um, because it looks like you're in a different culture, and you are. <laughs> and you are. Um, but, that's, but, but, but that's kind of one of the points is that um, the liturgical worship it does preserve culture also, and it, it and it it preserves it in some very important ways. For instance, uh, in the the Armenian rite, the official language is Krapar, which is ancient Armenian. So it's not even the Armenian that's spoken by Armenians today. That's why I can't understand it. And exactly, yeah, <laughs> but. But you, then you ask yourself, well, if it's not a spoken language, is there a value to retaining it at all? And people do debate that. But but the idea is that how we speak uh, conveys how we think, how we believe. And it also shows that we have respect for our ancient elders in, in the faith. You know, this this language which was developed by our forefathers. Uh, to express our faith in, in God, uh, to translate the Bible, for instance, in, in, in Armenian. Um, all of that is a way of honoring that, but also of keeping ourselves connected to a, a tradition which is millennia old. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it looks like we're kind of making it up as we go along, you know. Right. And we don't want to give that impression because it certainly is not true. So. Absolutely. Uh, so that's that's beautiful. And of course, because now two Armenians are speaking, we have to we have to point out to our to our viewers that Armenia was the first Christian nation. You yes. Know? So. In in about the year three o one, Saint Gregory the Illuminator baptized the pagan king of Armenia, and that king made our, uh, Christianity the official state religion of Armenia. And that happened roughly, you know, 10 years, 10, 15 years before the empire right. before started to become Christian, yeah, exactly. the Roman Empire. So before the Edict of Milan, before the Edict of Milan, Milan, yeah, you know, in 313. Yeah, so I loved, I, I loved, uh, I love history, and I, 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 it was my emphasis in graduate school, and I taught church history when I, when I was a high school teacher, and I loved, loved teaching this part that, you know, here the Christians were under extreme human rights violations, religious freedom persecutions, and all of that. And here are the Armenians, 10 years before 
uh, the religious freedom was a thing through the yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the Armenians had granted that not just that you were religiously free, but that that army that Christianity was the official state religion. So very, very proud of that. Because sometimes people get confused in history and thinking that Constantine um, made Christianity the official state religion. He didn't. He just he permitted it. Just permitted it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, very, very cool. And so then personally speaking for you as a, as an Armenian and having this kind of come out, um, how, what has been the, for you, the big takeaway, um, re not just reconnecting with your roots, but also just the Eastern right beauty and all of that. Cause I, you know, would love to, for those Good. who kind of go maybe attend, maybe what they can look forward to, maybe the same encounter can happen for them. Yeah, that's a, a, that's a very good question. And yes, so, so the, the first thing you said, reconnecting me to my roots, absolutely. That, that's, that's one of the very important things. But um, one of the things I, I began to kind of explore when I was educating myself on the Armenian right and the history of the Armenian right is kind of picking out the genius of of Armenian prayer. How do Armenians pray? <laughs> and, and, and when you're, when you're exploring any of the Eastern rites, you will also explore what language do they use to address God? How do they pray? How do they, what gestures do they use? What words do they use? Um, so you go to an Armenian rite mass and you learn how, how Armenians have traditionally addressed God, how they have understood uh, Trinitarian praise, how they understand the incarnation, you know, um, and that to me has been an, uh, an, an immense uh, education unto itself, uh, basically attuning myself to that mode of prayer, mm. because I'm, I'm, I'm coming at it from a, a, a different cultural background. I mean, even uh, Armenians here in America are not always culturally so, or they're not always culturally, I mean, and I certainly am not. Yeah. Um, but I'm learning <laughs> yeah. and I'm imbibing it through the prayers that I say. Yeah. You know, um, for instance, uh, in the Armenian, one of the unique things about the Armenian rite is that it's kind of a, a, a patchwork of a few of the other uh, ancient Eastern rites. So you have the liturgy of St. James, the liturgy of St. Basil, and of St. Athanasius mixed in together, and, and, and somehow it, it works. Um, so learning all of that, uh, and, uh, uh, some of the prayers that, that I say are every Sunday, uh, saying to the Lord, you are a merciful God and you love mankind. Mm. Uh, and, and, and that is a, a, a phrase that, that gets re repeated a lot. You lover of, you're a lover of mankind. Make me cry, Father. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, and, and that's, I think, an experience that, that people can have uh, attending an Eastern Rite Mass. There, it really does engage the whole person yeah. more, more than maybe a, 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 a Latin Rite mainstream, a Latin Rite parish Mass. Yeah. It en engages you, your heart and your emotions in a way that's, that's very, very powerful. Mm. Um, yeah. And you... You don't find the focus so much on the uh, horizontal aspect, the meal aspect, which is often what you, you get in many parishes, but it's on all of us lifting our hearts up to God who, who loves us, who loves mankind. It's about the worship. The worship of God, yeah. The fellowship of believers. Which yeah, is, yeah. Yeah, which is a big deal because that's... That's oh, what sure. we're going to do is to worship. So yeah. um, that's a really, really important point. And I think um, it's a strange in thinking about all these things and kind of throwing in the COVID element that, you know, having live stream masses, while not the same thing as having masses, um, can emphasize kind of that community and that fellowship. But mm -hmm. in, mm. in the mass, it's the, it's the worship. So in the liturgy, it's about the worship. And what I've been trying to do uh, in live stream masses is kind of beef up my spiritual communion and my unity. Yes. Because then when I can go back, I can be a little bit more fortified in, in making my offering with, with Jesus to the Father. Yeah, and, and Simone, that's a really, uh, that's a very excellent point to make. And I think it needs to be underscored that, you know, attending a liturgy online 
especially on, on, on a Sunday, although it might seem kind of strange and un, uncomfortable, is really important to do. And two, make those acts of spiritual communion. You know, prayers, uh, there, there are so many of them. Uh, St. Alphonsus has, has a beautiful one and, and a few others, very important ones. But to, to ask yourself, why do I want to receive God? Yeah into my life, into my heart. What fruits do I hope for it yep. to, to bring, bring about? The, the, the fruits of the communion. And, and it helps us to exercise our desire for the Lord. Right. That's, that's very important because I, I've heard some people say, you know, going to Mass every week and receiving communion can become a routine thing. Yep. And you're not thinking of how how transforming this should be for me on a regular basis and when you can't receive sacramentally what are you doing with your heart at that moment when you're watching a mass online yeah are you are you exercising a desire for god are you saying lord i do want you into my heart i do want you into my life i want you to change me yeah, uh, yeah. So, so that is a point that I think really does need to be emphasized, you know, make those acts of spiritual communion, not just on Sundays, but, you know, you could do it all day long for that yeah, matter. If you're, if, yeah, exactly. And, and live streaming daily masses, which I know some people are doing. Because yeah, that yeah. Cool. yeah. Thank you so much for that, Father, because I, I think we, I, mean, I don't want to speak for we all. I took the sacraments for granted. I take daily mass for granted. And so, and the danger with that is that it becomes not just like what you were saying, this like moralistic thing, but then treating the blessed sacrament like a magical thing. Like, oh, I get communion and I'm, you know, magic things happen and I'm a saint now instead. But my freedom, my disposition, my formation, my, you know, all of that increasing desire changes how effective the, the Eucharist is for me. So that, oh, for sure. yeah, so I think that's the kind of the, the part that gets, easy for me to forget but oh actually like i need to be using my freedom to, be, yeah. to allow them you know to allow myself to be begotten by the holy spirit right and so for me and, in a strange way covid has been positive in that way because it has you know it's a retreat in order to advance god willing yeah 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 and i i, I think um what what you just said reminded me of one of the lord's parables which i think is probably one of the best comparisons that the sower goes out and he casts seed mm. uh, all over the place, right? And and whether that seed bears fruit or not depends on where it goes. Does it does it go onto the path? Does it go onto hard rock? Does it go onto cracked earth, which is dry, or into good rich soil? So a, a good question to ask ourselves, you know, at the time of communion is what is my heart most like is it like a rock is it like you know examine so great yeah 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 and 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 our lord explains that parable and says some people receive the word of god with joy and then it gets choked off by anxiety mm -hmm. the, the pleasures of this world and all kinds of other things but there are some who receive it into good rich soil and it bears fruit so what do I need in order to receive the Lord well in communion is that good, rich soil. That is, I want to receive it. I want to hold on to it. I yeah. want it to, to grow, the Lord's, Lord's life to grow in, in my life. Oh, I, amen. So we'll pray for that for all of us, <laughs> our endowed women or any, anybody else that's not part of the endowed family and watching that, that that's what we, that's our desire and that's our goal. And it, it was really a, a real focus point for me during this time to to come back to that um the, the how much freedom i have mm. and how i receive and how i how i unite myself with with christ um so one of the other things that that is part of your vocation father is you spiritually direct and advise for you mentioned the the junior class of seminarians is that correct uh yes at our monastery yeah so in terms of um what are some, I mean, I think you gave us a lot of spiritual direction right there. So maybe, maybe, mm -hmm. this, maybe this question is pointless right now, but, but along with the, I, I don't know, I've really lately been getting into this concept and maybe it is old news for everybody, new news for me, but it just gave me, cause I always think about life as like, 
you know, your, your primary vocation, maybe that's not the right word, but like your state in life, whether you're called mm-hmm. obviously your marriage, whatever. Um, and then, you know, your, whether you have a career or a job depends on that state in life. And then there's like the charisms where, you know, how you build the kingdom and the spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit has uniquely gifted you as an unrepeatable being loved by God, where you manifest Christ's presence in the world, et cetera. But <laughs> this concept of personal vocation has really been coming out to me as actually that being the primary thing. And then, you know, your state in life and or your job or career kind of subsisting within that in your personal vocation, which is who you are. So I was wondering if you could kind of speak to, there's just so, I guess I'm thinking not just of endowed women, but of my high school students, my former high school students that I still keep in touch with who are really like searching for understanding their place and their personal vocation in the world. And I know that, you know, in speaking with many endowed women too, that they, you know, we, we want to know who we are. We want to know who we are in front of God and we want to know what to do with that, you know, and who, knowing who you are also really helps the whole, what do I do? Right. Uh, Cause it That's, flows from that. So yeah. do you have any, it's such a kind of crazy question, but do you have any helps for that off the top of your head? <laughs> Put you on the spot there. Okay. No, no, that's fine. Um, <laughs> It's uh, it is it is a big question, but what I would <laughs> what I I would say is um, we don't have to put too much pressure on ourselves to find our place. Uh, that's kind of an I won't say it's an il- illusion, but 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 but, but there are, are are some who 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 want to have a place where they fit, and and that's not always what God wants. You know, He He doesn't always want us to feel comfortable in this place and this place only Um, everybody has a state in life that is we are either married or single uh, consecrated as I am a consecrated person religious vocation um, some kind of a state in life okay where in which we operate we hold down a job we do apostolate we do all these things I think that the main thing is that instead of kind of boxing ourselves into this is this is who i am this is where i fit first i'm a child of god wherever i am uh, that was that was uh, one of the keys to the spirituality of saint jose maria escriva right i am a good child of god wherever i am and so in a sense it doesn't matter where i am yeah um, i love that wherever, wherever i am i can serve the lord according to his terms you know whether i'm on a bus or i'm on the beach or wherever i am that's where i serve god um so in other words a child of god feels at home wherever he or she is because the world is my father's world yeah and i live in it yeah. you know and and so i i'm all, 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 always at home so i would look if and and this this is a actually a chapter in in, in my most recent book well, actually, the, the other one. The, oh, but anyway, that's fine. That's okay. Oh, the, the other one's your most recent book? Yeah. Oh, Home I, again. I, I, I think I have a copy of I have a copy of it here. Oh, I bought the wrong one when I bought it. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but in this in this in this book called, called Home Again, I hope it's not backwards on on, on your side. I don't know if no, it's. I can, <laughs> okay. I can see it fine. Yeah. No. But I I only mention that because I think it's a very important point. You know. Uh, Christian identity. Who who are you, in fact? Yeah. Uh, because I think we we tend to, to to pin our identity on on things that are kind of external and and passing. Yeah. So I like to ask people, what do you think is the most important thing about you? Okay. What what is the most important thing about you? And people will come up with a lot of different answers. You know, like it's my job. It's my ethnic background it's mm-hmm. uh it's my talents it's you know what i've accomplished in life all of these things but all those things are more or less going to pass away yeah. you know you might not be able to do your job you may not be able to be a musician or an athlete or or, or whatever else is 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 important about you okay yeah. but maybe it's not the most Im- important thing yeah so i quote uh, St. Jose Maria Escrivá, who says, the person who does not realize that he is a child of God does not know the deepest truth about himself. Oh. And that's, and, and, and I think while all of us are at home in quarantine and we feel 
like we don't have purpose maybe, or we feel restless. Sit with that truth. The deepest truth about myself is not what I can do outside the home, which might be very good things, but the deepest truth about me is what God has made me to be, which is his beloved child. And it's there that I have to root my security, my self-esteem, mm -hmm. my I identity. If I try to pin it on, any on anything else, it's a lost cause. It's going to fade away. It's it'll gonna fade, fade away. away. It'll collapse. Yeah. I, totally. love that, I love that word rooted because, and I, I named my blog Cultural Gypsy, which uh, is a weird Implies word. you're not rooted. It, it implies not being not rooted. Yeah. <laughs> because, um, and it, I think it was, I think I have the quote on my, in my website, Simone Vai said that the, the, the most un, least recognizable need, but most maybe important need is to be rooted. There you go. Exactly. And, and I think it's been such a huge wound for me personally that being an immigrant kid, if you will, I, um, who am I Armenian? Am I Egyptian? Am I American? I mean, I am American, but I also really strong, at least, you know, but, and the, but that's not, that's secondary. And then, you it know, it has to be right. <laughs> it has to be secondary. And then feeling like, this American culture is very fragmented and very isolated and very lonely. And then now how do I operate as a human where, you know, when, when, when my identification ultimately is in belonging to Jesus, but being good, but going through this journey of like wondering where my place is and that being such a huge wound for me in a positive way, because that desire to be rooted was so strong. And until I found it in the church, um, it was this big question I was living, right? Because I wasn't satisfied with these partial answers, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and until I met disciples, real, you know, people who love me unconditionally without ever saying it, we love you unconditionally because you're <laughs> a beautiful child of God, but just having that experience then translated to, oh, oh, I belong to Jesus and I belong to Jesus through these specific people, which are part of the church and the family. Mm -hmm. And so then all these kind of pieces kind of started to make sense to me. And Father, I showed you my, my endowed cappuccino mug before we, before we, before we first record and quoted St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. And one of the great things, this is not the quote on here, that the quote on here, <laughs> it will never be commonplace if you're a vigilant in love. But one of the things that I learned that she said was that you're never alone because there's always four of you because there's a Trinity in you. And you, yes. And you and I, when I heard that, oh my gosh, is this not the answer? I mean, is this not the remedy to our, our cultural and societal ills? The epidemic of loneliness and the, 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 the real, I feel the real root of the problem, which is exactly what you're saying is that there are people walking around, Christians and not, who don't understand themselves that way. And I, as I was reading through parts of the book, there is a section in here about, about loneliness and how do you handle it? And I would love for you to speak to us about that. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I think um, uh, just, just uh, uh, piggybacking on something you just said uh, that, uh, you know, Christians and non-Christians alike are looking for meaning and identity and people want to belong to something that they will, they will, to join up with almost anything to feel like they're a part of a group yeah uh, e even even bad groups you know as yeah. as long as long as they feel like they're they're involved and and they're surrounded by a community yeah. okay yeah. now community is great and family is is es essential and yet it doesn't take care of the fact that we do have a fundamental loneliness on the inside that yeah. nobody yeah. nobody can quite heal that yeah um even in the in the closest friendships the closest marriages the closest families there's still a point at which you feel you can't be penetrated by anybody else there is that there's a place in you that that still re remains empty and that experience is universal you know even if we we never feel kind of painfully alone there is still that experience and that can be both a positive or a negative thing. Uh, I call it as a positive solitude mm. because that's, that's usually how it's explained uh, in, in spiritual 
writers and saints uh, like Elizabeth of the Trinity, for instance. Uh, solitude is being alone with God. With God. And being alone with him, knowing that he knows you through and through and he loves you through and through. That, is, that experience is, is extremely important yeah. to solidifying your identity and, and, and to making you comfortable being alone. Um, there are people who feel alone even when they're in the middle of a crowd. Yeah. Or they, they feel alone when they're at a party. That They just feel so, so painfully isolated. And what, the, what is that all about? You know, they, they, they want people to uh, fulfill them. They, 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 they want to have a certain a sense of intimacy, a certain sense of connection, a sense of fulfillment. And other people just can't do that for them, you know? And we're not really made to do that for each other in an absolute way. Yeah. But, but God has made us for himself. And, yeah. and he, he's the only one who can really fulfill us yeah. in that deep, deep way. So um, when everybody's now at home, more or less quarantined and maybe spending a lot of time alone and going crazy or feeling, you know, really anxious, this, this is a, a good time to kind of turn inward with the Lord and ask him in, invite him in to help you to heal, uh, to help you to find your true worth, your, your, your true identity. Um, be, because the, the painful experience of, of loneliness can be turned into a positive experience of intimacy with uh, God, you know? Talk about God writing straight with crooked lines or, yeah, just, yeah. or just using everything to bring us to himself. And I think one of the most important moments of my, of uh, under because what what you're doing in explaining this is normalizing an experience right because everybody thinks that somehow their suffering or their loneliness is like super unique and nuanced yeah but everybody's got it everybody, everybody's got it I, yeah. I remember i was suffering greatly you know going through something a few years ago that was and i, I mean original yeah. sin is so um takes such weird manifestations because I, I i was okay with the suffering as long as it was just oh so unique and no one could really, it was so melancholic and no one could really, but it's also stereotypical, right? In a sense, we're, we're normalized in that experience. But, but until somebody kind of validates that, right, and says, actually, this experience of this kind of wound, uh, this that can't be healed until the kingdom, right, that, that makes me okay. And that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that needs, to, we need to know that we're actually okay in that. Um, but I think uh, in, the, in this conversation of like discipleship, which is always the goal, we all want to be disciples and certainly endow women who are involved, we're on this path to discipleship and in, in, in increasing our belonging to Jesus, is that when we look to each other to fill each other, right, then, then the church looks more like a comfortable, cozy country club where we distract each other with good, godly things, mm -hmm. instead of the quasi uncomfortable, how are we getting outside of our comfort zones and becoming friends with Jesus. And a, I think it was Gregory of Nyssa said to be actually friends of God, not to seem to be friends of God. Right, right, right. And I want to be a friend, not just seem to be a friend. Right. And, and we know, you know, he knows the difference. You can't trick him and, you know, you can't trick yourself if, you know, when you peel all the layers of the distractions. So um, I, I see that oftentimes my, my worry and my date, my, my worry for, for the church right now, because obviously we're in a period of a new evangelization. We need to evangelize the church herself. This is the sad kind of fact, but here we are, the truth. Yes. <laughs> and, and we, we are, as Ratzinger says, a, a people characterized by a phenomenon of people un, unable to relate to God and we're in the church. And so we've got to kind of peel down peel the onion if you will like you're saying get to that point where we are in solitude and take those moments not to just distract ourselves but to allow the discomfort that leads to that beautiful intimacy and um and this is the, this is the goal so yes simon thank you for thank you for, for for saying that that um being a human being is an is an uncomfortable experience period <laughs> whoever you are wherever wherever you, you you're from yeah. And when, okay, so that's that we all have in common. Surrendering your life to God, surrendering your life to God is is going to be uh, exposing yourself to to some unfamiliar territory as well. It's going to be a little bit. Uh, you're going to feel a little bit in, insecure, yeah, uh, because we have to walk by faith. But 
that's exactly where we need to invite God into our lives, in, into our souls, where we are most raw and alone and confused, and allow him to be our healer there. Al allow him to be our, 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 our friend. You know, you are a, a lover of mankind, you know, as, 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 as we pray, you know. Yes. Um, so, and those, those words are real, you know, that is, that is, that is, that is, that is the truth. Um, so when we are alone, the Lord wants to come into that and to bring us, to bring us peace, to bring us healing. You know, I, I like to think of the image of the apostles in the upper room uh, on the evening of the resurrection. They're hiding, and they're afraid. Yeah, and they don't know what's coming next. Yep. <laughs> so Talk it's very awkward. sorry. Talk about awkward. Well, yeah, and it's and it, it's it's a it's an uncomfortable experience of being human and of being a disciple yeah and who who comes in through the bolted door but the lord and he he breathes peace upon them love that okay. yeah so you look how powerful that is and and just sit with that you know if you happen to be struggling with that kind of anxiety or or loneliness or just feeling kind of uncomfortable in your own skin yeah um, allow the lord that entry and and just quietly and calmly see how he addresses all of your needs amazing uh, and yeah. I'll let that relationship blossom and that's where the adventure is yes because usually you're watching you're watching the spirit fix all the weirdness in these weird ways and it's delightful to watch <laughs> i think and painful sometimes but delightful <laughs> too delightful too and i think i want to encourage especially um endow women right now who are discerning whether they should host groups or not and again endow is one of many great things that you of places of belonging yeah so, you know it it's it's um so i on a broader level just find that place of belonging or foster that place of belonging that is awkward but you know so many i'll get so many emails of women saying like well my endow group wasn't a success because a b or c and i'm thinking no that is successful that the person that make creates the awkwardness that brings up the tough issue that brings up this what are we here for right how we right. can't measure success from the world's eyes we've got to we this is what the spirit is doing and and that's what's that's mm -hmm. what matters or oh i'm not a very I, I don't have too much theological background so i i don't feel like worthy or that i could host a group no in fact your your desire is the strongest so you're precisely the person to host the group right so there's there's just so much um, I think my friend, Father Jim said this and I'll never forget it. And he said at the Carmelite house on our retreat once he said, um, the Holy Spirit is so desperate to use us. He'll use the likes of you. He'll even use the likes of you and me. <laughs> 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 so I just, I love everything that you're sharing with us, Father. And I know, um, I know you've got to get to the next thing. Uh, so I guess wrapping up, are there, is there any, I guess I want to mention once again, if you don't mind holding up your book, but this is uh, Father oh, Tom, yeah. praying from the depths of the Psalms. So I'll link this in our, in the uh, YouTube and forthcoming podcast. And then Father, if you want to show that oh, book yes. again one more time. So uh, this book was just published uh, in January of this year called Home Again, a prayerful rediscovery of your Catholic faith. Um, and this is the book in which I, explore a lot of kind of the basics of uh of our faith but in a maybe a more contemplative way um especially who we are our I identity our story where where god has brought us from and where he's bringing us to uh the, as as you say you know the holy spirit is so desperate to use us well who is he using what kind of person are you that he, that you know what's your personal history do you think you can't be used by him? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So these are these are our our, our two, two books of meditations and reflections that I, I've had the, the, the privilege to to have published. So if if they um, meet your needs, then I hope God will bless you uh, in 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 the reading of them. Great, great. Well, I'll link them. I'll link them on on the uh, on all of our stuff and our, all of our social media platforms and all of that. But um, so. And then, gosh, one more thing I wanted to ask about. Is there any, I mean, I, I, I mean, we don't have time to talk about it now, but I kind of wanted to ask you about the Norbertine charism. Yes. Uh, just 
you know, I would love to know about it. What, what, <laughs> because I, I, I mean, I've heard of the no routines for a while now because when I was living, even when I was living in DC, you know, when I would be Californians who lived in Southern, they were like, oh, the Norbert routines, that's like where I am home, right? Where I get spiritually fed. So I, before, before I even met you, decade before father, it was more, <laughs> more introduced to that community. Um, I have been hearing about it. So I thought okay. it would be beneficial to know a little bit about the Norbertine charism. I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a, in, a, in a few words if I can. Yeah. Um, it, we were founded in uh, 1121. Okay, so well over you know 850 plus years ago, or more or less that, um, as as a way of reforming the clergy on a, on a monastic model. That is, that the idea was to have clerics or priests living in community according to a monastic rule. So we follow the rule of Saint Augustine. Okay. Wow. So you have priests not simply living in a parish, but living together following a monastic rule and praying all the hours of the office in common. And that's really what the heart of the Norbertine charism is, is it's praying the sacred liturgy of the church publicly, solemnly, and in, in common. And in that sense, the quarantine hasn't stopped the main thing that we do. We also do parish work and we also teach and we do a number of other things, but the core of what we do is what we do here at the monastery in Silverado, yeah. which, which is kind of a, a postal address. We're, 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 we're closer to Mission Viejo than anywhere else, but, okay, got it. Um, but, that's, but that's really it. It is the reform of the, uh, of the clergy by living according to monastic principles and praying in common um wow. so love it love yeah. it well 1122 i mean i guess this is around the time of the mendicant orders of franciscans and dominicans were rising up so there it was a time of like holy like you know reform and it certainly was yeah, it so certainly that, was that, makes, so that date makes sense to me church history church history time yeah 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 it makes sense to me that this would be that's beautiful. Well, thanks for sharing that. And any last words before before we say goodbye? <laughs> well, uh, Simone, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate all the good work you're doing with Endow and what the the mission of, of Endow I think is so crucial at this time when a lot of mixed messages are being sent about human identity in general, who you are and and what you're meant to be. Um, only. God has the authority to tell us that. And, and I think Endow is, is, is a, a very beautiful instrument in, in communicating the message of what God has made women to be. And, and so thank you, Simon, for, for, uh, for being a part of that mission. We appreciate it. Pray for us and we pray for you. We pray for thank all you. the priests, especially every Friday is our Friday priest, priest intercessory prayer, Storming Heaven Day. But I thank you so much and pray for us. God bless you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who, who, who saw us today in the interview. <laughs> thank you, Father.